Okay, time to get started, I think. So while uh, you guys are enjoying the pizza, talking about pizza, this morning at the breakfast table, I was telling my son, okay, I got uh, a pizza lunch today. I'm not packing lunch. And he said, he shared a tiny one-liner joke with me. And he said, the customer goes into a pizza shop uh, he's supposed to pick it up and he's waiting and he says, is, is my pizza going to be long? And he said, no, sir, it's going to be round. So, <laughs> having said, uh, we'll get started. Uh, I would like to you know, uh, welcome you all for our uh, PHR seminar uh, the December month. And so far we've been like, you know, doing really great. Uh, some of the you know, great speakers we had. And having said, um, since uh, Shan is busy in a long home from meeting, I guess, today, so I'm having the pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Joshua Gong as our speaker today. I'm pretty sure, uh, you know, in the group, uh, Joshua is no strange face, so he's pretty familiar. Um, Joshua is a research scientist at the, you know, Agriculture Agri-Food uh, Canada. And uh, he was telling me the center's name has been changed to Gulf Research and Development Center. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he's, he's been associated with the University of Guelph in the capacity of adjunct professor. And he's also associated similarly with the University of uh, Manitoba. And he serves on the scientific advisory committee of CPRC, which, you know, Canadian Poultry Research Council, which is uh, a national you know, funding agency for uh, most of us. Um, so, and he also serves on the editorial, uh, editorial <coughs> board of two journals, the Bio Two Carbohydrates and Dietary Fiber, and the Food Biosciences. In uh, 2012, uh, Joshua received an award for technical innovation in enhancing production of safe, affordable food from the Canadian Society of Animal Sciences. Uh, just prior to that, in 2008, he received an award for excellence in uh, research achievement from the AAFC. Um, and before I say his uh, research, he also mentioned he, he graduated from uh, University of Guelph in uh, 1993. 1993. <laughs> uh, not too far. So. Uh, so as, as some of us, we all know that, you know, um, Joshua's uh, research, I mean, like, you know, it, uh, uh, he has strong collaborative, uh, you know, um, skills, and we already have some research collaboration with the University of Guelph. And his interests are in the, you know, gut microbiology, uh, particularly the aspects of use of, uh, you know, uh, antibiotics in the animal production, um, and also the food bone pathogens. And he's going to talk about the probiotics that uh, you know he has worked for quite a bit of time. And Joshua has received the funds from many agencies, uh, including the AFC, OMAFRA, CPRC, PIC, and also Ontario Pork. And uh, during his career, Mr. Um, Tong has been successful in co-authoring 130 papers and he has one patent and three applications in process. And uh, during this process, he has trained uh, several you know, MSc and PhD students. He also had uh, close to 20 visiting scientists and uh, you know, uh, postdoctoral fellows that he has hosted in his lab. So with much uh, further ado, so I would like to hand it over to Joshua. Thank you very much, Ravi, for the nice introduction, and also thanks for this opportunity. Before I start, you know, as you mentioned, I graduated in 1993 from uh, University of Guelph. I was a TA to Eva, and also I was a student. Uh, I take in the uh, isotope technical class from uh, Jane, and we were inspired by both in instructors. I, pre I very appreciate that. And um, I know this seminar is the last one in this term, in this semester. And I hope this is the best one. <laughs> 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 OK, um, I'm going to talk about uh, gaps and the tips in the development of probiotics. And uh, I believe uh, this seminar series 
And the pur one purpose of this seminar series is to broaden our mind and think of out of the shell. Think out of the shell. I remember this the words from Tim Nelson, and I like it. So therefore, my talk won't be limited only in poetry. Okay. So before I start, I just very brief, you know, uh, you know, in introduce, you know, my group is doing. The purpose, the objectives for my group is to mitigate the use of dietary antibiotics and also food bomb pathogens in poultry and in so on. The particular area including understanding the ecology of gut microbiota and also understanding the molecular mechanism of the probiotic effect. And meanwhile, we also try to understand the pathogenesis, uh, pathogenesis of some key pathogens targeted by dietary antibiotics, like Clostridium perfringens. And finally, we also try to develop some uh, uh, viable alternative antibiotics, for example, probiotics and uh, phytogenic compounds. And probiotics is defined as live microorganisms which were administrated in, uh, in adequate amounts confirm the health can confirm benefits uh, health benefits on the host and this including uh, prevention for example including the prevention of the infection of uh, bacterial disease uh, enteral pathogens and the improvement of mucosa immunity increase of the digestive capacity and also uh, all the enhancement of the gut tissue uh, development and the integrity. And the probiotics have been used for a long time in the history. However, there are still some gaps in the development and application of probiotics. It's this mainly including the lack of the solid scientific uh, uh, <coughs> scientific uh, uh, evaluations and the quality control and in production and application and also for understanding the mechanisms how the probiotics works and uh, finally and uh, prop animal models is very important to address those questions but often is lack. The, the general procedure for developing probiotics start with the microbial, microbial selection using the conventional microbiology uh, techniques. And after you select the candidates, then you go on the animal test. And if for human use, then you have to go to human trials. And for our livestock industry, we normally just stop at the farm uh, animal test and at this stage. And the last two steps are often the bottlenecks. And this is particularly problematic to AAFC scientists in Guelph, because I want to particularly you know, mention this, because uh, our center has no animal facilities. And we used to re rely on access to the animal facilities at the University of Guelph. However, since 19 since 2013, the access was denied, and we haven't resolved the problem yet. So, so, uh, um, so it's important for us, you know, how can we speed up the selection uh, to, to increase the efficiency of the development of probiotics. So the main point, the step, what we can do is on this side. Before we get into the animal test, can we narrow down the candidates uh, and reduce to the minimum number of the probiotic strains for testing on animals? And we can have different models like uh, yeast, mammalian cells, uh, nematodes, fruits, fly, uh, flies, and the mice. They all have these advantages and the drawbacks for each of them. 
but we have to know what our purpose, what our research purpose. And um, for example, for uh, for C. elegans nematodes, it fits in our purpose nicely. It it has two particular purpose uh, properties. One is it can be infected by enteric pathogens. The other the other advantage is it's a good model for innate immunity studies. C. elegans has been a common used uh, lab model. And I remember back to 1993 when I was in the States doing a postdoc fellow, I attended one seminar. People used the C. elegans to study signal transduction of taste receptor, the human taste receptor. And it was amazing. And uh, so it has, it inspired me to think about this, okay? And it's also easy to culture. We don't need to file AUP <laughs> to use it. And also, it's short life. One or two weeks, we can get one experiment done. And also, it has a clear background. And uh, it has great similarity to higher uh, vertebrates. In addition, it has 50% human genes uh, homologous, similar to uh, in the C. elegans. And also, the, their cell signal in pathways are clear. There, there are three major uh, signal pathways in C. elegans. On the right side, it's insulin related. It's associated with the longevity. And the middle one is MAP kinase. Yeah, it um, it's, has the function with controlling infection disease. So because of these advantages, so we start to use the C. elegans as a lab model, try to narrow down the candidates for, pro for probiotics to speed up the speed. So we, we use C. elegans firstly for pre-selection of uh, probiotics, and secondly, we also use for mechanism studies of probiotic effect. The target pathogens we include in Salmonella, uh, uh, Salmonella uh, type of murine, and also E. coli K88. Salmonella is common uh, pathogen to both swine and the poultry, and E. coli K88 is more towards the piglet for the diarrhea problem. Because of time constraint, so I'm not going to talk about E. coli K88 even though we haven't done some mechanism studies on how the lactobacillus to inhibit the this pathogen in the model of the C. elegans. The procedure we normally use, we start with mycobiology uh, assays to isolate uh, the lactobacillus uh, lactic acid produced bacteria from chicken and the gut, uh, from the chicken and the pig gut. And then we culture, we co-culture with the target uh, pathogens. And then we have we set about three uh, standard uh, selection um, selections. One is for low pH. Those, those guys can survive under low pH. And also tolerant to a high bile salt. And also, more importantly nowadays, is accessibility to the antibiotics. And these all three steps um, are done with the microbiology test. And after this, we test those selected isolates on C. elegans and to see how they behave. And finally, after going through this, we'll test on chickens or swines, depending on which, which disease we're going to target. And also, we want to study the host immune response from the C. elegans to give some reference to, you know, this just for reference purpose, to see what's the mechanism we can understand. We first try to establish the lifespan assay. On uh, the top, top panel, uh, those open squares on the C. elegans uh, in fact with uh, salmonella. So you can see within like a five, within the one week, around one week, 
Uh, because of an infection, all the worms are died up. And uh, for, because of selection eat the food, they eat the E. coli particular strain called OP50. OP50 is indicated by the cross, uh, by the cross, uh, the symbol. So you can see the days along, the whole, the, the all days, they, they are still survive and no problem. And we also tried those elective bacillus individually, only without a salmonella infection. And we found, you know, it also survived well. So in the next step at the bottom uh, panel, so we try to co like pre-treat it or after treat it, uh, uh, pre-treat the uh, no worm with the no probiotic, uh, with the no lactobacillus, and then infect with salmonella, or 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 after salmonella salmonella infection, and then we can see, you no know, again with the no positive control, the salmonella infection uh, infected the worms died quickly, and. Uh, those two curves are either pre-treated or post-pre-treated with the lactobacillus. And the lactobacillus can give a good protection to the worms from that caused by the salmonella. And this is a summary of what we have tested. And we have tested a bunch of the lactobacillus isolates. They all showed a good inhibition to salmonella in microbiology assay. But when they tested, when they were tested on worms, they behave differently. And some of them can, good, can give the good protection to the worms, and some are less. As I you know, circled here, so those green, you know, three, three of them, uh, they almost given a similar similar level of protection to the worms. This is a ES, this is a, this is a positive control. So this in, salmonella infected by, uh, worms are, were infected by salmonella only. And this one is the worms with the food, OP50 only. So the maximum we got is around 70% survival after, by the end of the essay. So you can see those guys are pretty similar to the worms which had only eat E. coli OP50. But also we have some not very good isolates, like say, you know, because this is a positive control, it's 17% survived. And you can see those 14%. Uh, so some, some isolates in the middle, they say like 40%, 30%. <laughs> Among, among these size rates, we, we choose, uh, we have choose uh, six of them, three good and uh, two in the middle. And uh, one, uh, one's the worst. So we did, we try, we test this on, uh, on, on pigs. And we, we, we found a, um, a pig farm with the history of the uh, diary, diarrhea. And then we fermented the feet with individual isolates. And then when we check those on the growth performance and also their effects on diarrhea. So among the three good isolates, two of them are still good. And this one is also good on, this one also good on silicon, but uh, it didn't, show good effect on pigs. So, so you look at the feeding, feeding efficiency, this is the pos this is the two controls. They are better, they were better. And also look at the diarrhea index and the uh, instance, these are controls. And also you can see, they also uh, better than the controls. So there are some correlations between what we see on C. elegant and also on, on the swan, uh, on, on pigs. So, so next, uh, uh, this paper has been published in uh, 2011. And the next, we try those isolates on chickens, uh, challenging with salmonella. 
And uh, our trial design is we have uh, six groups, and the uh, negative control is no salmonella challenging. And, um, and the positive control um, to salmonella challenging only. And we have, different, uh, we have four different groups treated with uh, a one single isolate at low dose and the high dose. And we also have a mix of uh, four isolates, three isolates, sorry, three isolates at the low dose and the high dose. And we're challenging the day one, we garage the probiotics, lactobacillus. And the day two, we challenge them with salmonella. And the four days after, we do, we kill the birds and uh, examine the birds. So these are reads out including uh, the management of salmonella counts in the sickum and the salmonella invasion to the liver and the spleen. And also we check the gene expression of SP1. This is a, a, is a pathogenic uh, island in salmonella which are responsible for gut invasion. And we also check the chicken immune response. I selected the uh, um, lactobacillus isolates, you know, couldn't reduce the salmonella burden in the gut. But however, only the low dose treatment appeared to attenuate salmonella invasion to the spleen and the liver. And also, we found the expression of those genes in the pathogenic island was significantly uh, attenuated in the in sickum. We also found gene expression of those pro and anti-inflammatory cytokine in the chicken to a bad, to combat salmonella infection was done was done regulated. So these are some specific results shows the invasion to the liver, and uh, we have run we have run two chicken trials, and um, because. Because in the isolation unit, we cannot run too many chickens. So we end up around two and each with 14, 15, or most of the 20 something. So we run the two trials and we combine that together. So, so you can see those combination, uh, only those low dose, single dose, single isolate, and the low dose mixture showed a significant reduction of the uh, invasion to the liver. And then the p value is like a 0 0.05, 0 0.07. It's a strong trend. I won't say significant. Okay, it just trend shows the lactobacillus at the low dose can attenuate the salmonella invasion to the liver and then the spleen. And this, show, this table shows the down regulation of the gene expression in those pathogenic island. And among these 10 genes, at the low dose, you can bear low dose and the high dose. And the low dose and high, high dose. And the fold degrees <coughs> in the low dose is, was much, much higher than those, than those with the high dose. And also for the immune response, um, I want to particular point out the, in the looking six because uh, it's highly associated with the salmonella infection. So from the positive control group, salmonella infection only, you can see it's much higher than those treatment groups. So this suggests that lactobacillus can also downregulate those uh, uh, in the looking six. Uh, in response to the treatment. So this, two, uh, this work has been published uh, once in uh, PLUS1 and once in uh, I mean pathobiology. Okay, the next step, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, tips using the microbiome approaches. Uh, this is uh, it's a hot area. So I hope I can have enough time to talk, talk well. Um, this Clostridium diff cell is the major cause for the antibiotics-induced diarrhea. 
particularly for those people hospitalized. And the current queue is to do a fecal tra transplant. This paper was published in 2014. They, the group, uh, research group in the States, the author identified what's a change in microbiota com composition, and then they inoculate those composition back to the mice and found out the change and also e elucidate what's the mechanisms. It's, it, it, it's a nice job. So they, you know, in hospital, they normally like use uh, clean, clean the mycin, the one antibiotics, and also anti, uh, ampicillin. And the third one is endofloxacin. When administration of the first antibiotics, like uh, clindomycin, they make the patients much more vulnerable to the clostridium, uh, to the uh, deep cell infection and the long, long term lasting. But, uh, but when treated, when the patient treated with the amphicillin, the effect was transient. The uh, deep cell infection will disappear soon, only uh, a, a few days. But when treated with the endofloxacin, uh, there's no infection. So basically, the patient become resistant to the disease. The group has identified microbiota. And uh, on the right, this shows the bacterial profiles. They appear uh, different. Then they do the micro, microbial ecology analysis. So this is the alpha, alpha diversity shows within the treatment group what's the bacterial di diversity. And they found the vulnerable patients had lower biodiversity than those resistant patients. And they compared to pre before the treatment for the antibiotics, they have similar microbial diversity. And, uh, and the panel B shows the beta diversity. That basically shows the treatment effect. When they have the treatment effect, they should, you should see the cluster together. So you can see from the uh, cryptomycin treatment, you can see the effect of the um, uh, clustering. But the ampicillin, you didn't see. It's mixed. There's no particular pattern. And when they, they further do the microbial ecology analysis with the left C and the uh, correlation analysis, and the, in human and also in, my, in mice, they, after analysis, analysis of the microbiota composition, they found the clostridium silence this one is particularly in direction against uh, deep cell infection. And the bottom is more closed against, and the bottom one is more enhanced. Okay. And they did the uh, networking analysis. They found like uh, clostridium sedents and the clostridium populati, they both are actually suppressed. The, uh, deep cell infection, but the uh, endococcus having enhance the deep cell infection. Okay, normally people get this stop, they stop the publish one paper, done. But this group continues doing the work, they continue digging. Then they, they try to inoculate those bacteria back. They have a single, they have a single isolate uh, Clostridium sedans. They also have a full mixture of isolates, which contains uh, uh, sedans, and also three unrelated isolates. One is in the middle, good. Two, uh, one is at the bottom, not good. And the one is outside, even not within their scope. And they found, they, all, they checked now, after inoculate this, um, Bacteria back, they check the uh, deep cell population. They found uh, with the four mixture, the deep cell infection, uh, the lowest one showed, 
and then the single uh, sedans also inhibit the seed, uh, 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 difficult infection. And this is the control just with the sedin. They also check the toxin produced by difficile. And you can see with the control groups, they all have a high level of the toxin produced by difficile, but not those green, those are the four isolates treated groups. The blue is a single isolate treated groups. So for the mortality, so even without the inoculation back of those isolates in the control group, the mortality is oops, mortality is 50 percent. And treat with the uh, sedans only, significantly reduce, maybe 75 percent. And uh, with the four isolates, the almost none mortality. So they also they try to do the species correlation. And they found sedans had highly correlated to the effect. And uh, there are these two, I think it's a bacillus, they have no correlation or low correlation. And also they analyzed the diversity of microbiota. They found that inoculation either single isolates or four isolates has no effect on microbial diversity. And this is shown by this figure. So basically, the three treatment group has the same level of biodiversity. So they went back to do some homework to dig out the water physiology for this uh, particular bacteria, Clostridium sedans. They found this bacteria has a unique characteristic. They, they had a, a bioacid 7 alpha detoxy detoxylating intestinal bacteria, it produced the enzymes crucial to convert the primary bioacid bio to secondary bioacid. This is unique. And then they measure the, the digester from those mice uh, treated with you know, successful or resistant. They found in the secondary Bioacid, bio it's significantly lower, was significantly lower in the mice, a vulnerable, and also, but much higher in a resistant the mice. They also further to look those, because they know this bacteria has a uh, special feature. They had a family, uh, host in the genes, which can convert the primary bioacid bio to secondary bioacid. They measured uh, those genes expression. They found like the significant difference among the untreated and susceptible, vulnerable and um, persistent groups of mice. So after they see this, they also look at uh, uh, because bio, secondary bioacid has a, a group, they look at a particular one which is the uh, detoxycholate. And uh, in the pretreatment group, you see it's pretty high level. But uh, in the vulnerable group, this DCA is pretty low, or what's pretty lower. And in the treatment groups with uh, either single or four isolates, they almost had the same level as the control group. So this confirmed uh, their hypothesis. And uh, then they also used, uh, they did another experiment. Oops. Uh, and this uh, chose steel red, uh, steel red mine, this is a particular com chemicals, which is the enhancer, enhancer of the, uh, which is the enhancer of the, primary uh, acid production. <coughs> so what they did, like in the, in the mice, treat with no uh, clostridium sedans and no this compound. They have clostridium, uh, clostridium diff cell infection at this level. 
But when they add in the uh, uh, clostridian sedans, the diff cell infection was much lower, okay, because the effect of from uh, uh, clostridian sedans. And when they add both sedans and this compound, so basically the sedans, uh, sedans effect was abolished by the, this compound. The level of the deep cell infection went back. So after they finish all this experiment, they can conclude it's a nice story. So that uh, Clostridian deep cell expresses 7-alpha uh, detoxy uh, steroid dehydrogenase, and which is crucial for converting primary bioacids to secondary bioacids in the column. And the uh, Clostridian deep cell can sense in the presence of primary bioacid as a signal for germination. So when Clostridian synthens there, because they convert the primary uh, bioacid to the secondary, so there's not much primary bioacid left in the gut. So deep cell cannot censor the signal, say, oh, okay, we can still rest, no germination. So that's the story they make. It's very nice done. However, we can still ask more questions. The question is, can we manipulate intestinal bioacid directly to control clostridium deep cell? The question two, do other spot forming bacterial pathogens have similar mechanism? The third one, can we target this special dehydrogenase for selecting more effective probiotics to control clostridium deep cell. So that's my talk today. So this um, is a funding agency. I particularly want to thank uh, uh, Canadian uh, Poultry Research Council. Uh, they have found a number, uh, found, uh, they found me a number of uh, projects. And also I got students from uh, China universities. Uh, most work was done by them. And thank you. And before I step down, I want to appear uh, that U U University of Guelph, I know you guys are all researchers to, to support the collaborations, but at, at, at the situation, it seems like, you know, make it difficult. So I appear, you know, University of Guelph can make the door more open to collaboration because this would be more mutual benefits to all sides. Yeah, particularly to AFC scientists you know, in Guelph who have no any more facilities. That's all. Thank you. Thanks, Joshua. Not just restricted to poultry, also on the difficile and the pink. Um, Joshua can take the questions if you have it. So, when we do competitive exclusion for chicken, we know the USDA is not mature, allowed in favor of using single culture. We just want to use you know, just multiple cultures to treat the chickens to sell them. Can you comment on this? Um, back to the history, like in the 90s, I think the guy, I forgot his name now. Actually, he graduated from animal science in Guelph. And he he's a USDA scientist. He initiated that work uh, in College Station. They called uh, uh, what's it called M M I I forgot the commercial name. They have 29 uh, isolates. They go through like a uh, culturing uh, form fermenter a long time to try to you know establish the culture, and was quite successful inhibiting almost everything, like salmonella, not only salmonella. In, in chickens, they start with chicken and also on, on pigs as well. They got a registration with the, um, uh, 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 not USDA, uh, food, uh, FDA. And later on, I think um, there's one publication, they found out one similar isolate from the one of their 29 shows 
antibiotic resistance. And this alarmed FDA, and they stopped, you know, they, they take it away uh, the license. That's what I heard from the private <coughs> conversation. But uh, it, we also test their products. What's quite amazing, like they reduce the salmonella infection by three or four locks. Yeah, so far, that's the best we test. Oh, I think uh, that's an issue in Canada, you know, because we, it's hard for Canadian farmers to import the products from U.S. because the CFI has, I think it has tighter, more strict regulations. So uh, we often hear these complaints when we have the meeting with the poultry industry. Yeah. So the other, okay, the other reality is the Canadian industry is small. It's small compared to US and uh, China. And uh, you know, for example, you know, we recently we tested uh, uh, butyrin, like uh, it's called the butyrin glycosylate. It has good effect, you know, to the gut health and also to reduce the ab abdominal fat deposition and enhance the breast uh, muscle. Uh, but then the, the problem is when we talk to those industries, those producers, like the manufacturers, uh, the company, they say, oh, no, 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 Canadian, Canadian market is too small. They, they like to make, make efforts in the States rather than in, uh, in Canada. That's a reality. Yeah. But you, you don't know the percentage of farmers that are really using You mean... Uh, I ask you the question, do you know what is the percentage of Canadian farmers and U.S. farmers who are actively using cultures to... Oh, this one? Lloyd, can you help very me? Low, very, very, very low. Okay. Very low. I think the issue, okay, there, there are some issues. Because, okay, you see so many publications with probiotics, but you have to realize a lot of them are not shown the results. They cannot get published. Maybe you one, you know, that <laughs> that's the fact, you know. Those published, they, they see, they, they saw the positive effect. Those not published, they didn't see it, but they don't publish, or, or they don't have negative effect. And also in the production, because for pro probiotics, it's a life, uh, organisms, they require the high skills, more technology, but you have to maintain, you have to do the quality control. You know, otherwise, it's going to be a problem. You, those guys even don't sell what, what they are sell, uh, selling. So that's why at the beginning I said this is the one of the cap. And also, uh, organs, they are alive, they all, always change. You know, they have mutation or they have, uh, sometimes if condition is not good, you know, they, they are not happy, they don't do the work. Or sometimes, you know, chickens or animals, they are healthy, they don't need it. Uh, in one of your studies, I noticed that you have considered 24 hours gap between the time of inoculation of probiotics and infection with salmonella. How much do you think that this time uh, could affect the ability of probiotics in prevention of the infection? For example, if it's got to be 48 hours or 7 days, or how much is it? would be the, the most that's a good time. technical question. Uh, I think uh, we uh, we haven't uh, seriously tested uh, different uh, like uh, in the intervals between the probiotics administration and the challenge with salmonella. Uh, we follow the Shayang's you know <laughs> protocol. Okay, uh, and the one phenomenon we saw like say if we leave too long like after challenging, maybe ten days. 
uh, you because I think the uh, uh, immunity of the chickens kicked in sometimes, and uh, salmonella counts came down. That's that's what we saw before. Uh, because in the farm situation, you cannot predict the time of the infection. You don't know how I mean uh, or when the infection oh. occurs in the in the farm. So we have to have a more precise yeah yeah. Uh, yeah, I understand your question, but if you think about when chickens come out, chicks come out, their gut almost sterile. You better to occupy their gut with probiotics. Yeah, and they leave no room for pathogens. That first come first, uh, you know. And my second question is that uh, have you have have you done any? I mean, testing on the stability of the genome of these uh, probiotics when they are administered. Because we realize that, uh, or everybody knows that, uh, the effect of these probiotics are very strain dependent. So if we uh, test so many of these probiotics, and some of them just show uh, better results uh, compared to others, and when we uh, administer to, to the chickens, what happens in the gut? Are they going to uh, I mean, uh, undergo any changes in their um, genome that affects their ability or efficacy? I think um, they are life organisms. I think they are going to change in response to where they are living now. But uh, the screening, so that's why we need to have screening, <coughs> large screening, large number of the isolates, pick up the good one, then you have a couple of them. Then you go to the animal trials and you see how stable they are, how good they are. Yeah. So for this reason, maybe we have to have the, uh, I mean, we have to test the probiotics before administering and then collecting some samples and yeah. test them again. This okay. This relates to our, un un our understanding of mechanism. So that's why understanding mechanism is so important. If we can pin down to what kind of mechanism, do we have a biomarker? If we have a biomarker, that'd be good. So, but often when deal with this, you know, kind of in a situation, there probably is multiple functions. But if we can pin down to which particular mechanisms or which particular genes has been targeted, we can use that as the biomarker and the jump into major that marker. But in the real world is not that simple. Yeah. Sure, sure. From, from the it's story, uh, like the do you see any uh, similar work in chickens or no. pigs or no. no. It's very nice town. Yeah. Yeah. And they are mice, you can do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They are work on mice, yeah. Okay. And no further questions. I'd like to uh, thank Joshua and as a token of uh, thanks. Oh. Uh, this is the OVC sick book. <laughs> okay. <talks> about, uh, <laughs> it tells about the zoonotic diseases and uh, it's about um, how the veterinarians can solve uh, certain medical uh, okay. Ma mysteries. Wow, that's great. I certainly want to look into the microbiota of those wild yeah. animals. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. And, and thank you all of you. Uh, there is an announcement. Dr. Shai Blavut is going to uh, make an announcement about a German company visiting us. Just a quick announcement. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to have a seminar right here at 1.30. Uh, I have there some visitors coming from uh, Germany. Uh, from Insulin, this is the uh, second largest uh, chicken company in uh, Germany now. Uh, so the CEO of the company is going to come and talk to us and also wants to hear what we're doing. So there are presentations of uh, seven or eight of the faculty here. So it's also very good for students to come and just get a glimpse of what is going on here. Uh, just a few words about the company, as I mentioned to you. Uh, it's the second largest one. It's an amazing company that uh, they have they're integrated, verti vertically integrated. Uh, they started the meat business about 15 years ago. Uh, 
uh, and now they've captured 30% of the market. So it's a huge success story. And listening to their CEO, it's uh, always amazing. Uh, it's a privately owned company, so he's in control of everything there. So I uh, encourage you to come, and you probably got the message from Ravi. Uh, for the people, I see some of the people here are going to talk to more. I'm just going to say it quickly. Uh, and I would like to keep the 10 minutes presentation there. We have a lot of people, and I just want to be fair to So hopefully, I'll see you more here as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you all.